Hey everybody, what's going on? It's Odie Coyote here with Mix Country 106 and Honky Tonk Saturdays. Hope you guys are having a fantastic day. It is a special show. It's going to be a great show, actually. We have a true Texas artist with us today. Uh, been long awaited. We've had him on the books now for just over a month. Ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, let's give it up for Mr. Randy C. Moore. How you doing today, Randy? Doing great. Good to be here with you today, Odie. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate uh, your time, and I appreciate you coming in here to uh, treat our audience not only to a great interview, but we got some great music coming from you as well. You're going to play a little bit. I'm going to play a little bit, and uh, whatever little bit I play, I hope it's uh, it's going to help your show. That's that's what we're here to do. Make a good show, buddy. <laughs> yes, sir. It's always about the show. And it's about the the listener. It's about the uh, attendee, your crowd, and uh, and all that. So all we're doing here, too, is uh, just to help promote you and get you out there uh, to a, a bigger audience. Uh, and we just so much appreciate that. So let's go ahead and uh, dive on in here. And I'll just kind of ask you a few basic questions here, because I think to a lot of my audience, it might be a bit newer to us. So uh, obviously, it looked like you've been playing country music a while. Uh, tell us a little bit how you got started and uh, maybe some of the reasons you got into country music. Well, I come from a little town called Humble, Texas, which is north of Houston. And um, I started writing songs when I was uh, just early in high school, when I was in the in the ninth grade. Um, and they were like country kind of a songs and everything. And so my dad actually went to high school with a guy who was a pretty big DJ there in Houston. They went to they went to high school in Memphis. And this guy thought my dad was the greatest football player he ever saw. So when my dad called him up. He said, well, sure, bring him on down. Bring Randy down. We'll we'll have a talk with him. So his name was Arch Yancey, and Arch was very instrumental in getting me into uh, recording and doing things and learning a little bit more about it. He actually had a show at Gilly's Nightclub in Pasadena, Texas, and so he would invite me out every week. So I was on stage at Gilly's about 15 years old of age, so to speak, doing uh, doing some honky-tonking myself singing some songs with the Bayou City Beats so that was kind of my first exposure to playing in in a live nightclub in front of in front of folks who were not only listening but they were dancing so it was uh that's how I got started then um, I got pretty serious about it and I thought I'd move to Nashville and live there for a while and learn how they make records and learn how to write songs better because most of the people who are really great at it uh either live there or at, they have lived there uh, at one point in time uh, so that, and that's what makes Nashville great because of all the creativity that's gone on there for years and years, not only that goes along with, with all the history and everything. So I did a whole lot of that. I got to be on the Grand Ole Opry a couple of times. I got to be on the, uh, Midnight Jamboree a few times. Both of them are great live radio shows. I got to meet and hang out with different people. Um, one of my boyhood heroes, a guy named Carl Perkins, I ended up getting to meet him and write songs with him. Um, so there were a lot of great experiences that I've had along the way and, and being in Nashville afforded me those experiences, but I got to where, um, I kept noticing that my music and what I was doing didn't, was always kind of out of step. And I didn't really understand that, but uh, the reason why it was out of step is because I always had one foot in Texas. So I finally came back to Texas and I've been making music here now for about four years and it's just been great. So it's been a good move and I feel right at home again and things are going well. I've, I've had some success recently with a, with a single that's uh, gotten to the, the top 40 of the Texas music charts and everything, and going to release another single here pretty soon. So it's, it's going well. I'm, I'm really happy with, with the way things are going away. I'm happy with the folks that I get to play for and the places that I get to go. So it's I got I got win win going on here right now. So <laughs> yeah. So I was just thinking to myself, but you mentioned a couple things. You mentioned that originally you were from Memphis. Is that right? No, I was born in Memphis, uh, but I was raised in the in the Houston area, North Houston area yeah. of Texas. Well, that's very cool, actually. Um, so I was born in Oklahoma, and uh, sorry, close enough to Texas, right? Uh, sure. Uh, but actually, I was raised in Memphis for most of my childhood. And uh, so that oh. was kind of cool to to have that. And so I was I wanted to ask, you know, if you ever went back to Memphis and you got if you ever oh, played yeah. like Bill Street or anything like that. Uh, no, I've recorded at Sun Records. I've played in Memphis at the Peabody a few times. 
You know, my mom and dad met in Memphis. That's where my dad was going to high school. He went to Messick High School, and then he went to Memphis State. And so my mom moved there and was working, and uh, they met. And so that's that's where they got married. So my dad vowed that that I was going to be born in Memphis just like my brother was born in Memphis. Uh, he had a particular doctor he wanted to make sure was handling everything. Dad was in the Air Force, and he didn't particularly like the the military doctors uh, and their uh, the way they treated things. So he wanted to go to his doctor in Memphis. So when my mother went into labor, they were living in Abilene, Texas, and he drove all night to get to Memphis so I could be delivered in Memphis, Tennessee. So wow. at Baptist Memorial Hospital, you'll know where that was. They tore that down not too long ago. Yeah, I know exactly where Baptist Memorial Hospital is. Um, so while I can't claim to be born in Memphis and all that, uh, I certainly spent my fair amount of time there. Uh, two of the Peabody's many times and seeing the famous ducks. Uh, yep. yep. So, uh, I, I know all about that. That's just cool. That was a personal question for me just because I haven't interviewed anybody who's actually from somewhere where I am, uh, Memphis, uh, it should be a good place for country music, but definitely it's known for the blues and all of that. Uh, Nashville, um, is, is kind of a cool place. I've only had the privilege of visiting there once. Uh, but when I did, I did get backstage passes to the grand Ole Opry. Uh, and I met uh, Charlie Pride, and I got to meet um, uh, Hank Williams Jr. Um, and uh, that was just really cool. Um, and to get to meet those guys and to see the dressing rooms in the back, uh, just a lot of history there. And so you said you got to perform there. Do you remember which dressing room you were in? I was actually uh, with Mr. Acuff, so I was I was uh, performing with Roy Acuff, so they put my dressing room next to his. This was back in 1978. Mm -hmm. And then I got another dressing room again. Uh, it was around 1990-something, 94, 95, I think I did. And I was next to little Jimmy Dickens' uh, dressing room. So yes. and this, this was before. Now, if you've been there, if anybody's been there recently, after they after the the opera house flooded they changed everything and they redesigned all the dressing rooms and put most of them had themes to people who have yeah. have either uh, been members or some even who are current members that they feel like that they need to pay tribute to as well so i haven't really been in the opera house since uh the flood that they had back in i'm thinking that was 2010 that's when it was. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, but uh, anyway, it's the same Opry House, same sound. And uh, it, it was a great experience for a kid. And then it was a great experience for a guy who uh, was a little older than a kid at that point. So yeah. um, I would not trade that at all. Uh, and you met two greats, uh, Charlie Pride. There was, there's no nicer person that, that ever uh, no. graced the stage and, and, uh, and was a superstar in my, in my opinion mm -hmm. than Charlie pride and Hank Williams jr. Is definitely no matter what people think of it. Hank Williams jr. Is definitely an original all the way. <laughs> he, he decided, uh, once things really changed in his life, he decided no longer. I'm, am I going to be the image and the imitation of Hank Williams? I'm going to be Hank Williams jr. I'm going to be Bo Cephas. And by gosh, he went out and did it. So hat my hats, off to him uh, and i've played a couple of shows with him as well too so yeah. uh he's he's great uh <laughs> my my story for hank williams uh is uh hank williams jr as i was playing in his beach club down in panama city beach and it was his birthday so he brought him and half of his band in and he came up on the stage and i handed him my guitar and he said well he said what makes this thing work and i said well i said if you press this button you've got this sound if you press this button you have this sound he just looks right at me and says which one makes it louder <laughs> i said just press them all hank <laughs> there you go so that's what i did so it was, it was a lot of fun that's awesome uh, that it's, to me, it's just cool. I, I could, I, I really want to talk about you, but I also want to, you, you brought up some stuff that's just so cool. Um, how many people even get to talk, you know, to some of the people who know or have met, um, the, these great singers. And, um, I think that's cool. And obviously as you've gone through your career and decades of it, uh, I imagine, um, you know, I got to imagine that you probably have maybe kind of tweak some things with your sound over the years just because you know you've gotten to meet these people and these influences um uh, how would you say the sound of your music has changed from you know when you were you know much younger several decades ago to today 
if any. Well, just like anybody, when you start out, you listen to all these voices on the outside and you you try to direct yourself in those particular paths. Um, if you stick with it long enough and you hang around with enough people and, and you let enough of that stuff rub rubs off on you, then you begin to realize you have to find your own path in your own way. So eventually, after you've learned a lot, or as, as some might say, after you've gone to college and graduate school, then it's time to shut off all the voices and take everything you've learned and then go inward, you know, look inside yourself and find what you do, find what you love, find what, what really makes you feel like you're doing something that's you. And so that was really the key. It, it took a while for me to get there because I've played all kinds of music in all kinds of situations. Um, I've, and I've enjoyed all of it. Uh, and all of it is kind of part of what I am, but really now the sum of it uh, and the sum of, of what I do when I make a record or when I go out and play a show, it's me. Um, and, and, and I learned, I did learn that uh, being around entertainers is different than just being around recording artists or even songwriters. Entertainers want to reach out and they want to include the audience or include the listener. And, and many, many times doing that means they've got to go the extra mile and they've got to do something that they know is going to grab the listener and get them kind of round them up, get them in their camp. And once you got them, then you got them. Then once, once you got them, once you got everybody on your side, then you can go, okay, I'm going to do this song that I made up. And um, I hope you like it. And by gosh, they already like it because they like you. So mm -hmm. it's important to be able to do that uh, with your music. If you're wanting to get your music out there, I'm not saying to to spend your life, you know, playing, you know, everybody else's songs. But I will say I played a couple of shows with Bruce Springsteen and I learned from him that his energy and everything he does comes out of him playing all those covers for so many years and his band uh, to this day, they'll go out on the road. And if he calls out Stand By Me or some cover, by gosh, they'll do it like they made it up and people will just lose their minds. But that's what he does. He he goes out, even who he is, he still goes out to win an audience. So that's really important for anyone who does this because I'm not put here to make myself feel as good as I'm supposed to be put here to make other folks feel good and give other folks, you know, something to, to hang on to and something to make them happy. That that's really my job. Yeah, no, that's, that makes absolutely, absolutely a lot of sense. And, uh, you know, that that's kind of what we do. Um, as much as, you know, I may just want to have my own, my, me, myself and I kind of thing when I'm broadcasting out, you know, you are putting yourself, but you're also putting out something to, to, uh, I don't know, help people feel better, help people through, um, a difficult relationship breakup or whatever the life case may be. Um, and I, I think that's really what's awesome about country music is, is it's storytelling. We're not just trying yeah. to drop a, a trap beat down and make things rhyme because, you know, they sound good. The, these songs have meaning. There's, uh, th there's heart that goes into them to pour out. And like you said, you're just out there to try to help people. You try to entertain them, give them a little bit of a distraction when you're out there on the stage and uh, just, yeah, that's that's what it is. And like you said, once you've got people, once you get uh, people, like you said, in, into your camp, then you got them. Then you can kind of help, you know, shape your sound and, and introduce things. You can try different things. Um, I, I think that's kind of a brilliant um, idea to, uh, I guess, go about being a, a musician, a performer uh, is uh, you, you do have to kind of think about, you know, the listener. And but you can still I, I see this a lot in albums. You know, you, you got your your two or three singles that are probably in there, and then you drop in a few like really good, clever ones that you just you just feel right, like they fit, and you you find, kind of mold them into the album. Um, I, I guess I'll ask you this: so, in your career, is there a particular album that you did that you're most proud of that maybe got a little bit underrated? Gosh, I don't know. I mean, I don't know that. Um, I, I think. I think that question probably would apply more if I paid a lot to 
to ratings and to opinions and reviews and stuff like that. Um, I've never really gotten what I would consider a, a, a bad review on anything I've recorded or put out. But at the same time, uh, that's really kind of all dependent on how much exposure something gets to. So um, to the scope or to the, to the world that I've been able to play these things to, and I've been able to uh, not only get played on the air uh, on radio stations and different things like that, to that to that effect, uh, things have been have been good. Um, so I don't know that there's a there's something that that I would go, boy, you know, uh, somebody really got that one all wrong. I, they they didn't read that one the way that it came out at all. Um, you know, you you get things when you write songs and when you put things out there, you'll get things where people will go, well, now this sounds to me like this, or it sounds to me like that. And really, I try to take that into account because. I will examine what they say instead of being offended by it. I'll go, no, wait a minute. What were they hearing that I didn't particularly hear the, the past 200 times that I was working on this song. Um, and it, it kind of helps you, uh, you help, it helps you realize that, that people are listening and they do care. And, and even if they criticize it, that's actually a form of them caring about it. Otherwise they wouldn't say anything to you, you know? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's there's probably a couple of songs that I've done where they go, well, let me see. Um, I did a song called Back in the Day uh, about two or three years ago. I put it out, and um, it wasn't really a single. It was on the album, but it was getting some play around some places. So a few DJs had picked it up, and one DJ said, well, I'm not going to play this. This is political. Um, it doesn't say anything about politics, but he felt like it was political, and I just said back to him, I said, you know, I, I appreciate anything you can do, but if if you don't want to play this one, <laughs> if you don't feel good about it, then, then don't don't worry about it. Because yeah. a, a song is a song, and and a lot of times, as you well know, um, it's going to hit somebody one way. It's going to hit somebody else another way. As long as people are still listening to it, that's all you can ask for when you're an artist or you're a recording artist. So, I don't know if I actually have an answer to that question, except except for the fact that I have had a few things where people will go, well, I'm not, I don't want to play this because it seems like it's like this to me. And I, I, I had a song um, that I wrote with a, with a fella. His name is uh, Heath Wright. He's the lead singer for a group called Ricochet, sweetheart of a guy. And we wrote this song and it's called a mother's prayer. It's on my Lukenbach album. And I put it out this year and um, Heath loved it. I loved it. Um, and he played it for some other folks and they didn't particularly like it because the song kind of has a sort of speaks about a woman who's given up her child for adoption and it sends a positive message. And the, the person that he played it for didn't have a particularly good experience being an adopted person. So they didn't like it. They said, well, I, I don't like that. That's not real. You know, and he's. Yeah, it was just, it, it, it was, and, and really a lot of times uh, a song will, will hit somebody, you know, personally, either good or it'll hit them not so good. And so, uh, you, uh, yeah. what, what's, what does Rick Nelson say? You can't please everyone. So you got to please yourself. <laughs> Amen. All right. Uh, just a quick follow up on that. I, I kind of have to somewhat disagree. I, I think by and large, and especially in today's, um, over political correctness uh that it's it's difficult for songs to talk about difficult things but i do know that it's happened um if you're familiar with the artist jason michael carroll and his song Alyssa lies that's literally a song about child neglect yeah and that one was that's probably one of his biggest hits that he had right and right. so and which obviously got a lot of radio airplay um so i do think it's possible for difficult songs um, to make it to radio, and I can't speak for every radio station, but if you want to know the secret to get on on Mix Country 106, here's what it is. I get about 50 to 75 artist requests every single month, and I'm not exaggerating even even by the number. I, I know because they all go into a special folder in my, in my um, email inbox, and once a month, uh, my wife, who's also my, one of my, produ my producer. 
Um, she's doing well uh, with that. And she's not here at the moment, so I'm doing this whole interview by myself, but she'll be here um, later on for the show. But what, what's interesting about it is we'll go through each of those songs, and I have about two or three different criteria. First and foremost, the, the song itself has to sound good. If, if I hear like the artist is just out of tune, just doesn't fit, if the mix is bad, if it doesn't seem like it was produced with, you know, a, a mastering kind of quality, it, it's out. It's out. Um, the only exception to that is if a song does surprise me, if I don't feel like it was recorded very well. And this is this part is subjective um, And every station, if they still have a music director or not, or if it's just the PD or station manager. Uh, that they're going to have their own taste and what they think is going to do well. And that just comes with the experience of knowing what the industry is doing, what songs are likely to become popular or are popular. The second way to get on Mix Country 106 is to have a top 20. Hands down, we always take top 20 Texas. We look at two different charts. We're members of the Texas Country Music Association, and we're also uh, part of the CDX Nashville. Um, So we look at both of those charts. They usually line up pretty well. Um, with the exception of like Cody Johnson's last year, Till You Can't, um, that one did not. That one had to be segregated a bit, but we still played it uh, because our audience is not just Texas, it is the whole world, and we felt like obviously it was a very worthwhile song to play. Um, and then the third way to get on Mixed Country 106 is to be showing progress in the charts. It's a We want to see, did you make it from number 60 to number 40? Did you... Um, do you have a new record? Are, are you an established artist? Are you growing? Where Where is this going? Have you made you know recent news about an album? You know we we do the research behind there. Um, for us, those are the three main ways that we evaluate it. Um, aside from the first one, which is just being good a good song, um, we we typically use the other two kind of standard methods. Where are you on the chart? Because we are a top forty Texas country station. Uh, we do play. A little bit of other stuff. We play like 90s country and all of that too, just to round things out. Um, And what's interesting is uh, Texas country today sounds a lot like 90s country. Uh, Yeah, it (laughs) it really does, (laughs) which is great. Um, Guys like me who grew up in the 90s and that was all I ever knew. Um, But then we also have one final way. There's actually kind of a fourth way. And that is new crop that we call it new crop country. And this can be from a new artist just starting out or this could be from a seasoned artist who is making a resurgence and uh, and we have a special category for those um and i I say all that because you talked about you know having um artists uh or not artists excuse me um radio djs and you know program directors um not want to play some of your songs you know because they misread it that's if you notice i didn't include lyric content in my right. evaluation, I included the quality of the music and those other factors. So if you had a song political one way or another, doesn't matter, um, and it was good, I let the listeners be the judge over what your local quality is, um, and I try to stay out of it. Uh, I'll admit that I, when I'm listening to some of these things, there, there's a few songs I go, I really don't want to play this, but it does meet the requirements. Um, <laughs> so... With that, I think uh, we'll wrap up the first segment. Uh, I hope that helped you out too, Randy, kind of get an idea behind what goes in the minds of, of radio people today. Um, but uh, no, I, uh, you know, uh, the, the way that you the way that you've laid it out is probably you've you've thought it out and you've laid it out there. You know, you're not not every day is is or, or am I dealing with or any anybody who's an artist. Not every day are we dealing with somebody who lays it out logically like that. A lot of times, you know, they won't be quite so logical and won't be quite so, uh, well, this is what really makes things work for us. It's, it's kind of a, you know, like I said, (laughs) if, if somebody's, if somebody's going on a personal preference, if that's, Hey, I always tell people all the time, listen, if you can make money off of it, go ahead, do it. (laughs) That's not the way that I usually do it because I, like I said earlier, I said, I've got to win over an audience, especially when I'm playing live. And that really doesn't have many times that have a lot to do with, with what my complete personal preference is going to be. I'm going to do, I'm going to do what's going to turn them on. And once I get them turned on, then once I win them, then it's then it's all icing. <laughs> I got to get the cake first. <laughs> yeah. No, absolutely. Um, 
And so I guess what I'll just kind of wrap up this first segment with is just saying, you know, I think it's great. I think you and I are on the same page uh, with all this stuff. I think our listeners are going to be on the same page with you, and I think they're really going to appreciate your music. You are new to Mix Country 106. Um, admittedly, we have not played a lot of your stuff in the past, um, but listening to several of your albums, I have a couple favorite songs. Uh, of course, I love the song Luke and Bach. I almost thought you were going to do a cover over the, the uh, other one when they say, well, let's go to Luke and Bach, Texas, Waylon and Willie and the boys. Yep. And um, I thought you were going to do that one, and then this one just comes on, and it's just, and take me back to Luke and Bach. I love that. that. Sorry, it's not quite an earworm in my head yet, um, but it will be. Um, and then Old Gray Dog. Uh, that was another one that I really liked as I was kind of listening through a few years. Uh, so uh, I, don't, I didn't say ahead of time that you were going to play those two songs, so I'm going to leave it up to you. If, uh, a Mother's Prayer I think would be kind of cool if you want to play that, but I'll leave this up to you. Let's uh, right. have Randy here do his first song here. I'm going to let him introduce it and uh, let you guys hear a uh, acoustic special edition version here for Mixed Country 106. All right, Odie. Well, this first one that I'm going to do for everybody out there uh, on my guitar is this song called Lukenbach. Uh, it was in the the top 40 of the T3R, and all the Texas music charts were really kind to this song this past year. Stayed on there for 22 weeks, and it goes like this. We spent too many TikToks working the time clock dead on our feet. And too many nights going to bed, going to sleep. Ending the days like they begun Never dancing to the beat of the drum Leaving me begging the questions I'm asking you now Do you want to go to Luke and Bach Or Waylon and Willie Or feeling no pain Or go walking up Drive Fork Road Make a little loving in the summer rain Take another trip to Arizona Watching the sunrise over the mountain top When you're in love, it doesn't take a lot Like you was going back to Luke and Bach We've seen tropical beaches full of beautiful people Working on tans The people on top of other people are a traffic jam Taking those selfies, waiting in line Telling the friends this is the life I hope they never discover where we're going now Do you want to go to Luke and Bach We're wailing and wailing I'm feeling no pain I Go walking up drive for gold Make a little of it in the summer rain Take another trip to Arizona Watching the sunrise over the mountaintop When you're in love it doesn't take a lot Like you was going back to Luke and Bach where the complicated tears and the fabricated fears drift away Forget about yesterday Come on baby, let me take you away Do you want to go to Luke and Bach? We're wailing and wailing, I'm feeling no pain I Go walking up Dry Fork Road Make a little loving in the summer rain Take another trip to Arizona Watching the sunrise over the mountain top. When you're in love, it doesn't take a lot. Like you was going back to Luke and Bach. When you're in love, it doesn't take a lot. Like you was going back to Luke and Bach. We're going back to Luke. And Bach. Uh, oh. Yeah, man. That's brilliant. Thank you guys so much. We will be back with more Randy Seymour right after this. Keep it clicked right here to Honky Tonk Saturdays and Mix Country 106. Welcome back to Mixed Country 106 and Honky Tonk Saturdays. Odie Coyote here for this beautiful Saturday night. I hope you guys are having a fantastic time. We've been having a fantastic time, I can tell you right now, because we've been hanging out with Mr. Randy Seymour, who is uh, back again joining us, and uh, we're definitely very thankful for him. And so, Randy, thank you again once uh, once again for, for giving us that great song, Luke and Bach. If you guys haven't heard it, it is on um, all major streaming platforms, including my personal favorite, YouTube Music. 
Um, so feel free to go out there and listen to it. And, uh, and dad, download it. Download his tracks because he's just a, a wealth of talent that young guys like me have yet to discover. Uh, and we're going to be talking in this uh, segment here about all of the, basically all the things going on with country music, the state of it. And we're going to get Randy Seymour, who's clearly a seasoned country music professional, uh, singer and songwriter. We're going to get his opinion on all that. So uh, let's dive right on in. Uh, so, Randy, you, you've, you've been doing this a long, long time, man, and, and you're still doing it, which means you obviously love it. Uh, you love what you do. I can tell that. I can hear it in your voice. I can see it in your smile. And, uh, and obviously, you're still making music today. Your new album's out and all of that. And uh, we might even have a special treat at the end of this, guys, uh, at the end of this segment, guys. But, Randy, let me, let me just ask you, when you're writing an album now, do you feel like you're going through a different writing process just to you know, please the masses, if you will, to, to, to get, you know, radio stations to airplay it um, and get it, you know, on people's Spotify list or, or YouTube list. Do, do you kind of feel like you're you're getting pigeonholed or having to write a certain way just because, you know, music's great, but you got to pay your bills? No, none of that comes into my mind at all, actually. Uh, it's actually probably as far from that sort of... Uh, process as, as it can be these days. Uh, I used to do that all the time and it, I never really got anywhere. Uh, when I started writing things and creating things from a personal standpoint, from my heart, from what I was feeling, then people started really listening and and tuning into what I was doing. I, I work uh, with a record producer by the name of Norbert Putnam. He and I are friends. And after I put an album out, back in uh, 2016 and it had a lot of songs on there that were just personal experiences and things i said norbert i said you know this album and these songs have done are doing better than anything i've ever done in my whole life and i said i just don't understand it because i'm not creating i didn't create anything on here to really um be have some sort of a mass appeal i just created this stuff because i really loved the way it sounded and i loved what i was saying he said, Randy, he said, all of the artists I've ever worked with who were most successful, he said, the most success they had was from personal experience. They wrote, they wrote what they knew. They, they said what they felt. They said what they knew. He said, if you go away from that, he said, then you're being untrue to yourself. So he said, to thine own self be true. And he said, believe me, that's what is going to work because if it sounds honest coming from you, he says, it's going to sound honest to everyone else. So it all made sense to me. So anytime I approach anything, I don't approach it with any preconceived stuff. And most of the songs that I end up writing or crafting, uh, I craft them later on. But the songs actually come to me really early in the morning when the house is really quiet. And it's still kind of dark outside and there's no noise and all I can hear is the sound of what's going on on my insides. Most of the songs that that have really worked for me have come that way. It's never been a a conscious effort of constructing it from the first word to the coda to the to the fade. Um, and that's that's the way I'll always do it. There's a lot of people who are great at, at they're great craftsmen, and I've worked with folks like that, and I've learned a lot from them. Um, they're great at crafting songs and and making songs uh, into things that they they've got the phrasing. They know what's going to be the ear candy. They know what's going to turn people on. They know what's going to keep the listener into the story and into the song. Those are all great um, gifts, uh, but they're not really gifts. They're more like learned skills, and I've learned a lot of skills from those folks. So at the core. What I'm doing is coming straight out of me, and there's no thought process of who's going to like this. It's really, if I don't like it, it'll never make it to the microphone. So that's that's kind of where I'm at. That makes a lot of sense. I agree with you wholeheartedly on that. I, I think you're right. You do have to be true, because if we're not being true, we're not being true to country music. Um, we're just appeasing the masses. So I just want to kind of get your idea on that. Uh, something that's been in the news recently in a lot of country music um, contributors uh, and uh, YouTubers and that who follow country music have been talking about this. It's this AI technology called ChatGPT. 
And if you don't know what it is, it's it's like your Amazon Echo on steroids. You can pretty much put in whatever you want, and it will put out a response that's really intelligent. Uh, one of the features that it has is a songwriting. And in fact, it can even write chord compositions. Um, some people have been using that. It's also been used in software development, practically writing the code for you. Um, there's, it's, it's kind of a scary technology. It's very innovative. But at the same time, um, I wonder if it could be misused or take away from, you know, music as a whole, as a craft, um, as something that could be basically just put traditional country music artists and songwriters, frankly, out of business. And all the record labels going to uh, want to basically drop people from the equation uh, and save money just to put out a bigger hit. And so, Randy, as someone who's been around doing this as long as you have, I, I know we talked before the interview a little bit about ChatGPT and what it is. What, what do you think about technology being used to essentially write songs um, for artists or for a record label? I, you know, I use technology all the time. It's all of it is a tool, uh, even as it comes this far uh, from what you described. Um, let me just set up a scenario for you, a theoretical scenario, because I don't know that it's true or not. And the theory is, is always something that hasn't been proven. Mm -hmm. Let's say that I am uh, the guy who is in charge or I'm the guy who's producing or making Taylor Swift's next, next record. And let's say that um, Taylor is going to write all of her own songs, but she doesn't really have time to write 12 great songs. Um, she's got, you know, a couple of dozen really great ideas but she doesn't have the time to really do them. Now, in the past, you would go get some really great co-writers and you would write those songs with them. Well, the record label and the producer and everybody else is going to have to make a deal with those songwriters and with those publishers in order to pay them for what their due is going to be when that record comes out. Now, if you've got something that can co-write with your artist who is a popular artist and who will sell records when it comes out and who will sell concert tickets and who will sell merch guaranteed, then it's probably a smart move if the darn thing works the way that they say that it works. Uh, if I was that producer, I wouldn't hesitate at all. I'd say, let's spend some time with this and see if we come up with a dozen really great ones that we can print and we can send out there. So that's one theoretical scenario of basically how it will work with the people who want to keep as much of the money uh, in their house as they can and not share in that with, you know, other creators and other things like that. So in essence, the music business is a business in the fact that the more of the pie that you own, the less that you owe anybody else. Uh, whether it's in tribute or whether it's in, uh, you know, charity, whatever, whatever it is, if you, if you own most of the pie, if you own all the pie, then you're not beholding to anybody else. So, um, and what that means is, is that means your property is more valuable because when you decide to sell that property, it's going to bring you more money too. Uh, for instance, if you've got a publishing company and a lot of the songs in that publishing company are written strictly by the, the writers who were signed to that publishing company, and those are great songs, you're likely to make more money off of selling that catalog than, let's say, if your publishing company had a lot of songs that were co-written from outside publishers and outside writers. So you kind of have to look at it from a business standpoint. It would be a smart move on several levels. For artists and for songwriters and for singer songwriters and when you say well this may put a lot of people out of business or this may discourage a lot of people or this may do this or may do that you know i we don't know what these types of things what the actual result is because we live in a society that's very short-sighted and we don't a lot of times our our society or our culture has gotten used to not looking past our noses so 50 years down the road, you don't know what this is going to do. Um, it could have the opposite effect. People could go, you know, 
what's this new music that's called blues that's that's written by you know people who are from the poor side of town and and they're playing guitars and and it's all they say this is all played by real human beings this is the most this is the the fresh breath of air we've been waiting on so be careful what you wish for is 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 kind of what i'm saying here and i'll i'll compare i'll compare this to the way that i have experienced music around the world uh, playing in different places in the world. I've played over in China several times. And when I get up and I play a country song or I play some rockabilly song or something, Odie, I'm going to tell you something. Those people lose their minds. You would have thought that I basically invented water for a bunch of thirsty people. The reason why is because it sounds and it feels different and it's something new and it's something that, that, that grabs them and it's alive and everything. If we mechanize uh, what we're doing enough, we're not going to necessarily lose listeners. We're just going to probably make it better when all of that goes away <laughs> and human beings get back completely more into the equation. So I'm not really, uh, what I'm saying is, is a lot of times, if this is something bad, then something good will come out of it. If this is something good, then something better will come out of it. Uh, it's not going to be something that I'm going to do just because I enjoy creating and crafting my own things and stuff like that. And quite frankly, um, a machine, no matter how good it is, is not going to know exactly how I feel. Now it'll, it'll be able to, it'll be able to make something that sounds great. I'm pretty sure because it'll have all of those things plugged into it uh, and it's little memory banks and all that stuff will be working overtime, you know, to make sure it delivers the the best sounding or the best you know, feeling piece of product uh, that that I can hear or or experience. But <laughs> for me, <laughs> I'll just go. Well, let's see. Let's see if my lawnmower will mow my lawn for me now. <laughs> I mean, we've got all that. So, so I don't. I don't see it. I don't see it as a negative. I don't see it as a positive. I see it as a tool, mm -hmm. and um, it. it you know the problem with with the with all all businesses and all industries and so forth and such is um a lot of times um businesses will get sold and the people that will buy them don't have a passion for the business so the business will go out of business mm -hmm. another thing that happens is um a lot of times you can take something that you you perceive what it is and you you try to reproduce it um, I talked to a, a friend of mine. His name is Joe Scaife. He produced uh, Billy Ray Cyrus's first album, and he produced Gretchen Wilson's album and all this kind of stuff. And I was in a meeting with him one day, and um, he had me sandwiched in between all these young ladies who were wearing cutoff shorts and little, I don't know, they had like Daisy Duke tops on, and they had cowboy boots and a beat-up cowboy hat. And they were waiting out in the lobby and I'd I, there was one that had come out of his office that was dressed like that. And then I came in, there were two more waiting out. So finally I looked at Joe and I said, what, what is going on? Are you, are you auditioning? He says, he says, ever since I did this Gretchen Wilson, Wilson album, he said, everybody's trying to send me the next Gretchen Wilson. I said, well, what are you going to do? He says, I'm not going to do it. I said, why? I said, you could make money. He said, he said, Randy, he said, I've been offered jobs to be, uh, a and R and be staff producer for a lot of record labels. He said, the only reason I haven't taken them is because I want to produce music. I don't want to reproduce music. So there's something to be said for um, somebody's sort of uh, integrity that they try to at least keep plugging into stuff like that. So as long as there's folks like that around the music industry, you know, the machines will help out and they'll do all they can do. But at the end of the day, it's going to be the human beings that are going to have to come up with it. Cause let's face it. The audiences are are human beings, and I feel like no matter what happens and what what goes on, I feel like that people know the difference between honesty and not maybe not dishonesty, but sort of faux honesty. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I, like, and that's the, you you you're honestly I think on point with most of that. I I, I kind of have to disagree with one aspect of it. Um, I think it's going to be harder for newer artists to become established because they may not have access to uh, all those resources. And if they're just using 
chat GPT to try to figure out what's going on or or write, um, I, I think it almost takes away a little bit from these new artists who have talent but just aren't able to compete because other artists are able to do these use this other tool much more effectively or or have access to to these other resources. Um I, I would love to well, see the plan. Uh, Odie, let, let me let me interject here because I will say that technology for years has been helping really horrible singers become superstars. True. So I don't <laughs> we have auto tune. <laughs> I don't I don't really see a whole lot of I mean I see the difference, but to tell you the truth, um as human beings, um, we're still supposed to be in charge. Now, if you just if people just want to lay back and let the machines do all the work, then they may as well find something else to do to be creative at. Because mm-hmm. as as far as I'm concerned, uh, if you get to that point, then you've just kind of said, "Well, we're not interested in even doing this anymore." So until they be until human beings and until musicians and artists and and even record labels until they become disinterested in creating it and being being part of it because it's exciting then it's really going to be just technology that's going to hopefully just add to what's going on and and I'll put it to you this way if you can learn how to write a great song from a machine as a young person i say that's a plus okay if that's if that machine if you can take an idea and and do it and then you plug it into that machine and it it spits it back out and says well this is the way it should be mm-hmm. you can learn from that you can go Well, that's great. Or you can learn, you know what, that sucks. I'm glad I'm not doing this this way. So either way, you know, you know, they, they've built machines that can learn and then, and that can comprehend and all this kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, they're still machines. And when you unplug the darn things, they go off. (laughs) Well, I mean, that's all true. Let me, let me bring let me give you a suggestion here Um, or not suggestion, but just a point of view. If, if chat GPT becomes as prolific as they've already sort of established it to be, meaning just new, innovative, and all of that, I think it takes away from talent. Because I don't need to know or have a mind to create a good uh, a good song. I, I just ask a machine to do it. I mean, heck, the machine can even put out a chord chart for me. What are we, what are we doing then? Um, and, and humans, frankly, we're lazy, right? This console here behind me, has made my life so much easier. I had this little, you know, old Behringer X32 thing, but it wasn't like, it didn't have a lot of faders on it. It didn't have the controls. It didn't have the routing. And and now I've used this. And because I can use this, I became lazier about my mixes because, well, this thing has an auto mix thing. I can, I can just hit auto mix and it'll balance everything out for me. I don't have to do it. I don't have to know how to engineer, you know, for, for a radio show or for a song if I'm producing it. Um, I'm I'm afraid that Chat Chat GPT is going to basically de incentivize people to actually learn how to write a good song, and they're just going to let the machine do it. Do Do you remember in school? Um, uh, you I mean you're probably you know uh, we're in school long ago where calculators didn't exist. Okay, I remember though I was in a, an interesting period growing up where, for the most part, until we got to like ninth, tenth grade. We weren't even allowed to use a calculator. All the math had to be done on paper. You had to show your work. You had to show that you knew how to do it. You know, now today I just pull out my phone. It's got a calculator. If I need to do a time conversion, you know, because we back time all the time on radio, I don't even have to think about back timing, even though it was something I learned how to do on paper long ago. But because I can have my phone do back timing uh, on a calculator for me, I don't, I don't, I don't think about doing it. I just put in the numbers. That's what I'm afraid chat GPT is going to become, um, if I'm being plain and simple about it. Now, I don't know if you agree or disagree with me, but I really fear for um, people who are truly creative, who know how to write good music. And I, and I do see your point. People are going to be able to tell if something is authentic or not up until AI becomes sophisticated enough where it really becomes hard to tell. Um, you can already tell it. Write a Luke Bryan song about margaritas. And it'll probably spit out. <laughs> it'll probably spit out one of his big hits. Honestly, that's what I'm afraid of. Is we don't even have to learn how to write. Well, uh, uh, let's let's just say that everything is generational. It depends on what the next generation embraces. Uh, right now, the this generation, I've I've been to enough places and I've been around enough. 
this the younger generation i'm talking from your age on down uh and most of them are uh high school age college age and 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 older than that but not too much older uh they've embraced technology uh to the point where they're really more interested in what's going on on their on their smartphone than they are interested in what's going on around them. Mm -hmm. um, now, when that's going to stop and when that's going to change, I don't know. It changed to this. Uh, is it ever going to change? Is, there, is it going to change back to something else? Or are people, is a generation just going to go, you know, this is boring. This is what our parents did, you know. Yeah. Um, so, in a in a way, uh, because music is 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 such a a generational thing, because music is a an artistic thing, because music is, is all these different things. Um, once once a generation or two goes by, who knows if if AI is going to be? Oh man, yeah yeah, you got to get this next album. You know, well, who's the artist? It, 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 <laughs> what's really strange is is it almost goes back to um, the early 60s and, and the rock and roll and pop uh, music business where um, there weren't any bands making records and there weren't really any artists. They would pick a pretty face and they'd put them in the studio and, you know, they'd gussy up their voice and they'd, you know, maybe put them in a film or something. They, bec they became idols and they made money off of them, but they really weren't a real artist. <laughs> they yeah. were they were sort of fake, you know. Yeah. And that all got you know blown away by by the beatles and the rolling stones um so there will always be as long as human beings are human beings there will still always be some faction that's going to go and that's and the faction that i'm talking about is the faction that's going to spend the money on it and spend the time because they love it um you were talking about your your new fangled uh machinery <laughs> that, that helps you do your job easier yeah I don't think that's being lazy. If you were lazy, you wouldn't show up. If you were lazy, you'd have it in your bedroom and, you know, you'd, you'd have somebody, you know, catering your meals to you every day. You know, you still get up, you're still excited about what you do. The minute that you become not excited about it, that's the minute that you say, I'm done. This is done. You know, this is, this is all terrible. And younger artists, um, you know, this may be this may be the new the new demon or the new thing that that they face or the new wall that they have to get around or they have to climb or they have to figure out. But with every generation, there's always been some sort of a demon or a wall or something for music artists or even about anybody in entertainment. There's always been some hurdle, some big huge hurdle, some standard, some thing that they've had to get around. Uh, in order to be heard or in order to be seen uh, in order to be understood. So um, I don't know that there's an answer to this question because the answer would be short-sighted. We're going to have to wait and see, you know, what it all means. I, I Heck, I say, let's wait and see what it means in two years, in four years, in six years, you know, yeah. six months. That's not a, I don't think that's a good litmus test for that because anything that's new people are going to be excited about and they're going to say, Oh man, this is the greatest thing. No, <laughs> it's, uh, uh, that was new Coke. New Coke was the greatest thing. They got rid of that. <laughs> you know, they went back to old Coca-Cola because they went, Oh, people don't like this. Yeah. They don't like it. They, they can buy a Pepsi. They don't need new Coke, buddy. So um, if you're talking about it in, in, in the sense of, uh, of where it's at the marketplace, mm -hmm. that's, that's where, the the dynamic comes in if you're talking about it on from a personal standpoint um if it discourages people from wanting to learn how to play music and be inspired to be musicians then i would say that's a huge drawback but maybe not uh, maybe maybe they become musicians and they do this because they want to say you know what i want to do this because i love it that machine can't love anything okay so it's still a machine so all right. I will basically leave. gives you no answer to this question whatsoever. <laughs> That's all right. You know what? I think that um, the answer I'm going to take away is this, we're going to need to wait and see. Um, I don't normally, I'm not very patient like that. Uh, my fear is that if you don't take care of something, if you don't nip it in the bud before it becomes a problem, then uh, it's going to become. 
But I, I can respect your idea, though, because what if it's not? What if this, what if this uh, does become an actual useful tool that doesn't, maybe we, we mold it and it's used um, by artists to just kind of polish up, you know, a song or, um, you know, give them, give them ideas. You know, we've all heard of writer's block and all that. So perhaps we can use it for something like that. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, if I would, it, hey, listen, let me tell you something. If it works and it's, and it really works great, you will see a lot of record labels, you know, basically using that to make records on their current artists who are money makers, the people who are paying the light bills. That's why I used Taylor Swift as a, as a theoretical example, yeah. because she's going to sell records. She's got millions and millions of fans. Why yeah. not? Yeah. You know, why not even, why not just at least try it once? But you can look at Garth Brooks and say, well, you, you tried to be Chris Gaines and that didn't work. So you had to go back to being Garth Brooks. <laughs> I thought you were going to say Chris Ledoux, but. Was... <laughs> you remember Chris Gaines? You remember the album that he did oh, as Chris Gaines? That's been forever, man. Okay. See, that's how forgettable <laughs> it is. Garth Brooks created a, an alter ego because he was doing so well. He decided to create an alter ego. He was supposed to be a pop artist who his parents died in a, in a car wreck. And, you know, mm -hmm. he, he drew all these different stories together to create this, this faux pop artist to call himself Chris Gaines. Look it up sometime. Yeah. Well. And he put out an album, they put an out, out an album. And of course, everybody sort of saw a way of, because of they knew doing something artsy fartsy of... and it completely tanked and country radio practically kicked him off of the air for it. You know, they did. Yeah. <laughs> so so he he won everybody back because he said okay i was uh, that was just i was just messing around it was a big joke you know but yeah. uh it was it was not accepted at all <clears throat> so like i said who knows this could be this could be a chris Gaines moment for artists for other artists um okay maybe maybe not well that was <laughs> fantastic chris Gaines, though yeah, you'll, I... you'll you'll learn a lot about garth brooks just through that yeah no absolutely um no, I, I think um, I think you're right on, um, and I, I think that you're, you've got a lot of good points, and it was just really cool to hear your perspective, too. That's all this really we were trying to do here. I think you gave us something good. Uh, all right. Well, folks, I've got, we got one more song here with Randy, and uh, to kind of give you guys a special treat, the song has not been fully released yet. We are proud to be uh, letting him play this song here for us, and I'm going to let him introduce the name and all of that. But uh, thank you guys so much for listening to Honka Tonk Saturdays. As always, hit us up, mixcountry106.com. You can put in your song, your song dedications right there on the homepage. And uh, also be sure to follow us on social media at mixcountry106. Randy Seymour, take it away, sir. So here's a little song here that I'm going to send out to Odie, my friend here on the air, because he grew up in a little place called Memphis, Tennessee. Let me tell you all a story about my Uncle Gene. See, Uncle Gene was just 16 in 1953. He was a junior at Humes High School in Memphis, Tennessee. When he met this kid in English class who changed all history. So come on, my friends, I'll take you back again in my rock and roll time machine. Well, it was Friday night in Memphis, 1953. I was bumming smokes and spiking cokes, bopping at the teen canteen when he came strolling through the front door, wearing pink on pink on black, with hair shined up and slickered out like a brand new Cadillac. His mama named him Elvis, and he was a shy and skinny cat. He was going to be the king one day, but he hadn't done it yet. Before Elvis was the king. He was just a high school teen Before that's all right and go, cat, go He was just a kid in funny looking clothes You wouldn't have believed it If you could have seen Before Elvis was the king I'll just get started now, here we go We'd always call him a sissy boy But the girls are fascinated By the way he curled his upper lip Somehow it drove him crazy He had an old beat up six string guitar With a rockin' little sound And when he played a high school talent show He tore the whole house down 
Nobody ever saw him coming Least of all was me Till I saw him shake and run of the world on national TV Before Elvis was the king He was just a high school teen Before he ever made his story It was metal shop, math and chemistry You wouldn't have believed it If you could have seen Before Elvis was the king Oh, come on now, guys Woo! And the world It was driving shows Back seats and trying to kiss a girl You wouldn't have believed If you could have seen Before Elvis was a king Oh, you never would have believed If you could have seen Before Elvis was a king Oh, that's a child Uncle Gene told it to me And that's all Talking about me. Mm, I'm gonna mess with you pretty good here. Mm.